uh, during my red wave journey last year where I challenged the, the dominant narrative of the election because we saw data that was showing that we were going to have a close competitive election. And I stuck with it and thank God, right, that we were right. But one of the things that was so remarkable to me was the people I met along the way and all the groups that I was able to speak to. And one of the reasons I was so certain that we were gonna do better than expected was because of the passion and the intensity and the love of country that I found in all the meetings that I did with all of you. I mean, what I found when I went out into the Democratic Party was not dispirited folks. I found people committed to go to work. And so, you know, the energy that all of you brought really kept me going as well during that battle. And I'm now trying to continue through my new project called Hopium Chronicles, which is a substack. I'm trying to produce, uh, take a lot of the analysis that I do and make it more easily accessible, more widely available, easily accessible to folks in the grassroots and to continue to produce stuff that I think will be helpful to people as we all do battle together to make sure that MAG is defeated in this next election as it was in this last one. So thank you for giving me the opportunity here. So let me make a couple points and then we're gonna to talk to Laura and we're gonna have Q and A time and we're also gonna hear from Natalie, which I'm excited to hear about. Um, this last election was one of the most remarkable midterm performances uh, in the history of the country. You know, we had just had two very good elections, right, in 2018 and 2020, where we won the House and Senate back and we won the presidency. Um, but everyone expected this last election to be a wipeout. And I wrote a piece in late 2021 saying I thought this was going to be a close competitive election for three reasons. One is that you know, the Republicans had just run towards MAGA, a politics that the country had rejected in overwhelming numbers in two consecutive elections, that the Democrats will have done a good job and we will have an agenda that we could sell to the American people and Joe Biden's been a good president. And the third though, was that I knew that due to new technologies and the grassroots, the amount of money we were raising, that our campaigns were gonna be much stronger than they had been in previous midterm elections. And I felt, that that secret sauce, that magic thing that we had, that we had seen come up in 2018 and 2020, was going to mitigate, make it less likely that we were going to see a big drop off of our vote. And that's basically what happened in the election. I mean, we, they were too crazy. We had done good enough, right? We've been good enough. And all of you in the Democratic grassroots gave our campaigns unprecedented amounts of money. And you all did the work to help drive the early vote in particular through the roof. And so, what happened in this last election was almost a miracle. I mean, the more that you spend time with the data, the more remarkable it really is. Because we didn't just hold our own in what was supposed to be a bad election. We gained ground from 2020 in Arizona, Colorado, Georgia, Minnesota, um, Michigan, New Hampshire, and Pennsylvania, some of the most important battleground states in the country. We actually improved our standing from 2020, an election that we won, a national election that we had won. Um, and we did it because the money that was raised and the work that you did gave our campaigns the ability to control the information environment, to not allow the right wing noise machine to overwhelm the system as it does so often in our day to day work together. And also the grassroots and the money also allowed our campaigns to build unprecedented field operations. We had the biggest field operations we've ever had in a midterm election. And you could see that in the early vote, right? The early vote was actually better for us than 2018 and 2020. Incredible performance. It's one of the reasons that Tom Bonnier and I were so confident that we were gonna do better than people expected. Um, and we ended up having this miraculous election where can imagine what would have happened if MAGA had won the Senate and they had made gains in other places around the country. I mean, we picked up state legislative chambers, we picked up governorships. It was an amazing election. And I just wanna thank all of you. That's the good news, right? Is that we gain ground in the battlegrounds and our strength in the battlegrounds now as we head into 2024 is very strong. It's, we're in very strong shape. But outside the battlegrounds where we didn't have these big campaigns, where we didn't raise all this money, we actually fell back, right? We fell back in California, New York, Texas, and Florida. And to me, that's the other part of the story, which is that they're still much louder than we are and they can control the information environment when we don't build these muscular campaigns. And so 
My challenge to the Democratic grassroots as we head into 2024 is we have to keep doing the work in the elections, right? We People have gotten very good at that. It's groups like yours all over the country that are just proud patriots getting up, you know, doing their work. You know, it's amazing for me to be speaking to these groups because they're all over the country and they organically grew up because of the fear of MAGA in recent elections, is that all of you, have, we've, we know how to do the work in elections. Look what just happened in Wisconsin, as Laura was saying. But now we also have to, I think, expand our mission to be involved in the daily information war. They're playing politics 24 seven, 365. They don't just do it during elections. And we've got to figure out how to close the, what I call the loudness gap that exists where they are so much louder than we are. They control the information environment day to day. And we always feel like we're responding to them instead of set, you know, take going on offense and, and running and controlling the, and controlling the daily discourse. When I worked in the war room in 1992 for Clinton, it wasn't about responding. It was about controlling the information environment. It was about getting ahead of them. It was defining the terms of the debate and letting them respond to us. But when they responded, then we would respond back, right? It was the whole dynamic. We've got to figure out how to go on offense and be loud and proud about who we are, about our values, the things that we've done for the country. And I just want to give you, a, I just want to read a, a couple of things about what Joe Biden has done as president, just to give you an example of the kind of things that we need to be talking about so much. And this is in my work on, on Hopium Chronicles. GDP growth, since Biden's been president, has been over 3%. It's three times what it was under Donald Trump. There have been six times as many jo jobs created under Joe Biden as under the last three Republican presidents combined over 16 years. We have had the best COVID recovery in America. It, our economy has recovered from COVID faster and more robustly than any other developed economy in the entire world. We've had just in the last few months, the lowest poverty rate ever recorded in American history, the lowest uninsured rate ever recorded in American history, and the lowest unemployment rate in a peacetime economy since World War II. We've seen very elevated wage gains. We've had historic numbers of new businesses get started under Joe Biden's presidency. Today, there are two job openings for every un single unemployed person, a record. That means that for every, there are two open jobs for every unemployed person, um, and which is why we need more immigrants, not more child labor in America. Real earnings were up in 2022. The deficit has gone down every year under Biden's presidency. It went up every year under, under Trump's presidency. I could go on and on and on. The bottom line is that we have been a force for good in America. Since 1989, when this new age of globalization began, there have been 48 million jobs created in America. 46 million of those have been created under Democratic presidents. We have repeatedly, when we've been in power, made things better for the American people. They've they have repeatedly failed to do their part. And in recent years, they've actually gone and become dangerous, right? MAGA has mutated and become and transformed into something that's just not a failure for the country, but something that's endangering the Republic. That's why we're all here. So my view as we go forward into 2024 is I would much rather be us than them. We've now done really well in three consecutive elections in the battleground, the battleground states, the ones that determine the presidency. And we know that in this last election, we've now seen over the last three elections, we've now litigated MAGA three times in the battleground and all three times we have prevailed. So it means that if you look at the Republican Party now, you know, is there a possibility that they're going to present themselves as something other than MAGA in 2024? I don't think so. It's going to be Trump, maybe DeSantis, although he's stumbling and bumbling out of the box pretty significantly. But even if Trump somehow isn't the nominee, and he's currently ahead by 30 points, right, in against DeSantis, the 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 stain and the and the you know the the of Trump's um, illegality and everything that he's done is gonna be something that's still gonna be in the daily discourse. We're still gonna, that party that's presenting itself right now as this radical, out of control, uh, you know, angry political party is still gonna be the party that we're running against in 2024. And we're gonna be able to say, you know, they're still a little too crazy. We've done a good job. You know, we deserve to be, to be, um, to win the presidency. And so I am very, I feel very optimistic that the basic dynamic that we saw in this last election, 
right? We've done a good job. They're a little too crazy. We know how to win in the battleground states, right? Our position in the battlegrounds have improved is that that dynamic is gonna carry forward, whether Joe Biden is the nominee or not. I mean, right now he's running for reelection, right? But until he makes that announcement, you know, anything is possible. And I think if we end up having a big primary, I think it will be very healthy for the Democratic Party. I don't think we should fear it. I think we've got a lot of wonderful leaders who would battle it out, right? Gretchen Whitmer and Gavin Newsom and Jared Polis and make your own Kamala Harris. I mean, a remarkable group of people that I think would have a very invigorating primary for us and make it, it'll be clear that this next team that's coming is strong, is very strong and capable of leading the country. So I think either way, whether we have a big primary or whether Joe Biden runs for election, I'd much rather be us than them. And so I, I think part of the reason I'm here is just to really challenge all of us, I think, to recognize that MAGA has uh, has become uglier today, I think, than it's ever been. I think that the ugliness of the Republican Party probably has no real precedent in American history, what's happening with the modern Republican Party. And people are noticing. They're standing up in Tennessee, right? They're standing up in, um, you know, uh, in Wisconsin, where we got to 55. Uh, you know, we've got this very important race in Jacksonville, Florida, that I hope some of you will help with. Where our candidate, a pro-choice candidate, largest city in Florida, be a huge blow for DeSantis if we take away. It's a Republican-held city, one of the largest city in America with a Republican mayor, by the way. Uh, and we've got a great candidate, Donna Deegan, who's a hedge by eight points. She got to 54. We got to 55 in Wisconsin. And let me just end with why I think that number matters so much. What I'm challenging our family to think about is to recognize that we just can't every two years feel like we've felt in these last few elections, where if somehow we stumble, you know, the country, we could lose our democracy. And I think that we have to try to not just win this next election, but to win it really big so that it feels like a deep repudiation of the direction the Republican Party has gone in. And that's why I'm challenging us to think about how we get to 55 percent nationally. Biden got 51.4. And now I'm saying, I think by growing our vote, expanding our coalition, that I think we can get to 55. I've done the math on this. I've worked in this kind of demographic stuff for a long, long time. I was very involved in helping our party uh, from in the mid aughts, right? We went from 47% of the national vote to 51. We did that by identifying new coalitions and new demographic opportunities. And we built a politics around that. And so we've done it once before. We went from 47 to 51. Now we go, got to go to 55. Why does it matter so much? It matters because if we can win by 10 points in this election, not by one or two or three or four, we could break the back of MAGA politically. And that would be good for the country. It'd be good, frankly, for the Republican Party. It would be good. It would relieve us of this unbelievable fear that we have because part of our goal together is that we have to weaken MAGA. It's not just about beating Republicans. And I think the only way we're really gonna to start to loosen the dark grip of MAGA on the Republican party is by beating them really badly in this next election. I think they're allowing us to do that. I think they are abandoning the middle ground and giving us enormous space that we can go into. And in order, as we just saw in Wisconsin with 55% of the vote, Donna Deegan in the first poll in Jacksonville is at 54 in Florida, right? She's up by eight points, again, that same number. And so in addition to getting loud, what I'm hoping we can all do together is have the ambition to be strong, to go on offense, to expand the coalition, not to reposition, but to go big. Joe Biden went big legislatively in 2021 and 2022. We now need to go big politically. I think this is within our power to do. And I think if we can do that, we won't just win this next election, but we'll do something historically important for the country, which is we'll start to loosen MAGA's grip on the Republican Party. And hopefully we can begin to think about having a Republican Party that's more like a traditional center-right political party again. I think that's what we all want, right? We want to be able to just have normal politics in America and not be scared about losing our democracy every two years. So I just, I'm here tonight just to say thank you um, we did something really big and important together in 2022. What we just did in Wisconsin was incredible. I think the next big race we have is on May 16th in Jacksonville. It would be an enormous blow to DeSantis to lose 
He's got an, a, a Republican who's running because the mayor is termed out, is a big DeSantis ally. DeSantis is putting a lot of money into the race. They're trying to win this thing. This would be a huge blow to Trump and to DeSantis if we can win in Jacksonville on May 16th. We need to then continue to focus on getting to 55 and also obviously learning, and Natalie's gonna be talking about this in a few minutes, how we can get louder and more effective in our day-to-day -day communications. So thanks everybody very much. Really excited to be here and to support your incredibly important work. And thanks to Laura and the team for giving me the opportunity. Laura, I wanna to toss it back to you. Thank you, Simon. That's terrific. Um, I want to bring up sometimes when I talk about getting loud, uh, I find it's really helpful to give people a concrete example about what that means. Yeah. So could you talk about um, how Democrats poll on the economy versus Republicans and yeah. the debate that's going to happen this year? Yeah, look, I think if I could wave a magic wand and, and do two things this year, the Harry Potter School of Political Organizing, right? I would, I would focus on launching a national youth voter registration campaign to dramatically increase the number of young people who vote in the next election. It's the kind of thing that we should be putting tens of millions of dollars around. And it's a universal project that we all could be working on, right? It would be a great man on the moon kind of thing that we could do together. But the second thing I think that's important to do this year is to get into more positive territory on the economy. I mean, despite the fact that we've had three consecutive Democratic presidents who brought job growth, higher wages, lower deficits, and three consecutive Republican presidents who brought recessions, higher deficits, and American decline, people today trust the Republicans more in the economy than we do, than they trust us. And we have to change that. I mean, we know from polling, and I'm sure Natalie will be talking about this a little bit, we know that when we talk to the people about how much better the economy is and inform them, give them basic information about Joe Biden's agenda, we can move into positive territory on the economy. The economy last election was not the most important issue, COVID was. In this next election, it's almost certainly gonna be the most important issue. It is either number one or number two, right? In every election, and it's usually number one. We can't do what we wanna do next year if we're trailing the Republicans on the economy. And so what I've been doing is producing a lot of data and a lot of uh, analysis showing how much better the economy does under Democrats. If you come to my Tahopium Chronicles, I have a whole 30 minute presentation that goes through data over the last, um, since 1989, and shows how much better the economy does. There's also a lot of written documents which you can use. But I think in terms of getting loud, Laura, the way to think about this is, you know, I worked in the war room and the war room, you know, with the way we think of the war room, we think of like 20 sweaty kids drinking Red Bulls, you know, producing videos every day. But the war room in our mind's eye should be two or three million proud patriots networked together, wired together, amplifying good, the good works of the Democrats. Uh, and if we two million people a day reach 10, 15 million people now, you know, we're reaching tens of millions of Americans every day. That's an incredible tool for loudness, right, to take our agenda. And it's my view that even though there are groups like Midas Touch and Courier Newsroom and Resolute Square, Deep State Radio, Pod Save America, who are doing remarkable work at helping you know, bring our agenda to more people. In the next two years, I think the most powerful way we can get louder is, is the grassroots of our party, just doing a little bit more every day or once a week, whatever it is. And I always joke, you can reach your friends through the way that you reach them. You want to be loud without being annoying, right? As we all know, you know, in this business, you can be a little bit too enthusiastic sometimes. Um, but I think we have to learn together how we can be information warriors for our democracy. And just to put out more pot to learn the data, put out more positive information. And, I, and if I can say one last thing, Laura, is that it's really become my opinion and my understanding that the main, one of the main goals of MAGA is to put negative sentiment into our discourse every day. They want us to think bad about our democracy, about our country, about our institutions, our leaders, each other, right? They want, they are putting intentionally negative sentiment into our daily discourse. And I think that the way we really, one of the most powerful ways we beat MAGA is by responding to that with positive sentiment 
by putting positive sentiment into our discourse. I mean, this is the most remarkable country in the history of the world. We, our story that we have about, you know, what we've done, the good that we've done, the modern world that we've built that have created more opportunity for more people than any other time in human history. There is so much that we can sell. Our story that we have and about, you know, what we've done, the good that we've done, the modern world that we've built that have created more I think that's the streaming. Somebody's got the streaming on, if you can knock that down. Um, And if, and so, thank you. So, I think there's so much that we can sell. And I think part of what I'm doing is saying we have to become intentional about it. And I want people to think, and I'm going to be doing more work about how to do it and producing smaller videos and things that are a little bite-sized. But there's so many good people like Natalie and others who are doing great work in this space that, you know, I think over the next six to nine months, we can make enormous progress. But I just want to challenge everyone to think of yourself, not just as a person who writes postcards, and makes calls and texts, but as somebody who's an information warrior and is spreading the good news about the Democrats through their networks every day, if we can get half a million, 600,000, 700,000 people doing this on a regular basis, you know, we can close the gap uh, with the Republicans on on loudness. And, and And so part of my challenge to all of you is do it in whatever way it feels comfortable. Take baby steps, right? And I will continue through my work to continue to coach and create you know, ideas and strategies for how to do that most effectively, Laura. And thank you, that was a great question. So I see going by in the chat, uh, Democrats are always down on themselves about how they message, right? And so you hear a lot, like we talk about policy, you know, they have anger and emotion and that's what moves them forward. One of the things that Natalie will address is how we can talk about the economy in a, in a persuasive way. Um, so it doesn't have to be that we don't have to talk about policy to make to make our positive arguments. There, there's there's a whole narrative what for us to to foster um, around the economy, and it can be done in such a way that it reaches people. And as Natalie will probably say, we're not trying to reach maggots. We're trying to reach the people who are. Like, That's a good point. You know, I can I understand that. I didn't know that. Um, and then Simon, you also mentioned. Um, Midas Touch and uh, Resolute Square and Courier Newsroom and your own Hopium Chronicles. Yeah. There's a new um, media ecosystem getting going for, for Democrats. And it's, it's I want to say to this group, it's largely funded by the users. It's large, largely yeah. user supported. It's not funded by a couple giant Republican or Democrat in this case families, right? So. I really want to encourage everyone, including your groups, to to look at those new um, organizations that are springing up, and think about supporting them. Because you know, the sooner Simon has resources to, you know, hire someone to help pump out short form democratic, short form content on the economy, you know, the sooner we can all be plastering that all over the internet. Um, so actually, we're going to put in the chat. It looks like we already did a list of. Um, media organizations, also a list of positive content sources. So these are sources of pre-made shareable content. You don't need to create your own content. You just need to spread it. You just need to know where to find it and spread it. Um, And if I can say, Laura, if I can just jump in about that, is that I think the point Laura was making about how these are these organizations like Courier Newsroom and Midas Touch and my Hopium Chronicles is that this is us taking control, right? This is, we have more agency than we understand. I think that this, you know, what I'm trying to help people understand is that it's not really up to just Joe Biden and the DNC to figure this out, is that you, all of you went to go work to get people elected, right? I mean, you didn't, no one gave you permission to go do all the stuff that you've done and all the work that you're doing. And I think that the what's so strong about the Democratic Party right now is that we are taking control of our own destiny as a country, right? That we are, that we have agency, that we are not powerless. They are not inevitably louder than we are. This whole thing that what authoritarians want is they want you as 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 uh, Timothy Snyder has said, to obey in advance, to do their work for them. And if I can just give another example, Laura, on the, on the loudness front, is that I have this theory about Democrats that we have to learn how to speak in declarative sentences, 
So let me give an example. Joe Biden is a good president, period. No but, no however. The Democratic Party is strong, period. No but, no however. We are, we live in the buts and the howevers as Democrats. And the thing is, when we do that, we're doing Republican work for them. When we repeat their arguments in our own language, we are doing their work for them. Do not obey in advance, right? Do not make their arguments for them. I went on Fox News for 17 years. I did thousands of appearances. I did during the entire Obama presidency. I went on three, at least three times a week for eight years on Fox. I was in the heat of the battle. And what I did when I went on Fox was that I had two things that I was going to say. I didn't care what the questions were. I didn't care what the debate was. There were two positive things that I was going to say about Democrats in every appearance I did. And I would say, you know, that's a great question. You know that, you know, Joe Biden's been a good president. Right? And I would just make my declarative sentence. And then I'd say, and then let me answer your question. Right. And we have to get better at not, not repeating and internalizing their arguments in our, you know, you've got one bite at the apple, two bites at the apple, right? Say positive things. Yes, we have to, I saw a question mark, I mean, a, a comment about us needing to continue to indict them, but they're doing a pretty good job of that themselves. I think the part that's missing that people don't know is how much better things are in America today. And let me give you an example. Let me just give you data, right, on this. In a poll that Navigator did, which is a polling source that I'd recommend if you want to have a place you go look at, they release stuff every two weeks. It's a lot of graphs. It's very easy to see. It's a democratic polling outfit. Is that they polled a year ago and asked a simple question, which is were more jobs created in 2021 than in 2020, right? This is a fact question. This is a sky is blue question. This is not a feelings question, right? And in 2021, we had more jobs created in one year than any year in American history. And in 2020, we lost 3 million jobs. So should be a pretty easy question, right? If you think about it, only 20% of Americans knew that more jobs were created in 2021 than in 2020. And, you know, to me, that's the equivalent of people in 1946 not knowing that we won World War II, right? I mean, it's, it, it's a it's almost as if they don't even understand what's happening in their own country. And, you know, we, we, that's why I'm so optimistic about how we can, through this concentrated work, you know, if you look at what Joe Biden's doing, 60, 70, 80% of his events right now are about teaching people and talking about the bills that he's passed, the good that's going to come from the investments we've made. They know this, Right? I've spent a lot of time with the White House and this stuff. Ron Klain used to tweet my stuff out all the time. Some of the charts and graphs that you see Joe Biden using came from my with Democrats presentation, right? I mean, I work with these guys very closely. And they we all know what the issue is here. And that's why I think there's an opportunity, Laura, for if you can participate in this effort to help people better understand better about what's happened in their own country. Right. You know, you're doing it's an, it's something that's um, you're doing. You're doing you're being a proud patriot by doing this. Right. Because people deserve to know that America is better off today than it was. That's my third line is that Joe Biden's been a good president. The Democratic Party is strong and the country is better off. Period. Declarative sentences. No ifs, buts, no however's. Right. And we just have to get comfortable, I think, spreading positive sentiment, saying not living with their negative attacks in our heads and anticipating them, but learning how to liberate ourselves in some ways. The way that I help liberate us all from the red wave, this false red wave narrative, so much of the many of the narratives in our stories that we hear every day are false. They're right wing memes that have been pushed through the power that they have. And so this process that we have to go through to rebut them. Right? We have to first start by going on offense and telling our story and telling a positive story about the country and the Democratic Party. Um, and I think that if we can do that, I think this is something that's achievable in the way that we won Wisconsin, right? that we can win in Jacksonville. We can change the story and the narrative about the American people, who we are, the greatness and the goodness of this country, and reclaim this thing that I think we all feel is being lost. 
which is the sense of common purpose, the love of country that we all have, wanting to live in a virtuous place that we all, many of us who are older, grew up in, in a time when America was the, this remarkable country in the, on, the, on the global stage. We can reclaim that. And if you, any of you who read The Economist, I know it's an elite publication, but they just did a whole story this week about how the American economy is blowing away everybody else in the world and has in the last 40 years. And that why don't Americans, literally the cover story, The Economist is, why don't Americans understand how much better and stronger their own economy is than virtually any other economy in the world? And my answer to that, it's because of them. It's because of Donald Trump. It's because of Fox News. It's because of the right wing noise machine pumping negative sentiment into our discourse every day. Liberate yourself from going there. Live in the light, live in the positive, live in love of country. That's how we beat MAGA in my view. So I think that's a fabulous segue to what Natalie is gonna share. I just wanna say a few um, housekeeping things. So. Uh, there's a lot of links in the chat. And one of the other things we're going to put in the chat is we also want to hear from everyone on this call. So we're putting in a Google form where you can let us know about other sources of content, other media organizations you think you sh we should add to our list. You can also just send us a note at info at swingleftpeninsula.org. We will be sharing all of this stuff with all the attendees after the call. Um, and there was one other thing I wanted to mention. Oh, yes. So I wanna say, I, I think I forgot to say this at the outset. Um, there were more than 30 groups who helped advertise this event to their members. And I did that not only to have lots of people here from Simon, but I did it in the hopes that we would all start working together more closely on this job of getting louder. Because obviously if we follow each other, if we share each other's stuff, the, everything moves more quickly, right? So there's, uh, we're putting a link to um, the content and uh, contact information for everyone that I know of who is on this call in the chat. If you'd like to be added to that list, you know, please get in touch with us. I'll, I'll add you. Um, and we're going to be using this as a, as a base to go ahead and get louder together. So uh, now I'd like to introduce Natalie Burdick from Sister District Project San Francisco. Natalie is uh, very knowledgeable about persuasion, and she was the founding captain of that sister district chapter. She's held um, multiple leadership and communication roles in tech, in campaigns, and in advocacy organizations, and she really has a lot of knowledge to share with us about how to get loud effectively. Um, so Natalie, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Simon, for always um, leading with that inspiring information. Um, and just to uh, uh, correct the record, I was one of the co-founding uh, district captains for Sister District Project San Francisco. There were several of us, um, but I'm happy that I got to be one of them. Uh, I think the really important things I wanna convey uh, very quickly about the training that we're gonna be offering is that how many people on this Zoom, and I can't actually do a survey or see you necessarily, but who here is a messaging expert? Who does messaging for a living? I'm gonna guess most of us don't do it for a living. So when someone says, hey, you've gotta go out there and be a messaging uh, strategist and be really good at messaging, I think for many of us, that sort of creates a bit of anxiety of like, well, how do I do that? What's the best way to do that? What are the things I should be saying? What are the things I shouldn't be saying? Um, and the, the only difference, honestly, the only difference between us and the, uh, the Republicans is that they're more disciplined about their messaging. Like we actually have fantastic messages, but we don't always do them in coordination. Um, so the purpose behind this training is really to give all of us the skills to be able to tell those stories that are gonna really move voters. Um, specifically leading with our values. This is something that Simon said repeatedly. We have an incredible story of success to sell, to tell. Um, we're just not always very good at telling that story. Instead, what we often like to do is highlight how bad the Republicans are. And in truth, they are terrible. Um, and they have an entire echo chamber of lies, uh, disinformation, projection, gaslighting. They're doing great with all of that negative information that they're, they're putting out there. 
our role is not to focus on what they say and do, it's to focus on what we do and what we offer and to do it in a very specific, um, discreet, formulaic way that people can sort of wrap their heads around and say, hey, I get how this works now. So whenever this new issue comes up, I can apply this very simple framework to it. Um, and I just wanna be clear, I did not come up with this framework. I was introduced to it um, after Anat Shankar Asoria was a guest speaker at the Sister District Summit um, two years ago. And then I attended a Words uh, That Win training and it just spoke to me. And I thought, how can I get this out to more people and how can I break it down so that folks can actually internalize it? What's a way that people can understand that this is slightly different than how we normally talk, but actually the best way we can talk to other people? And it's not just folks that we know in our general circle, but it's a tool we can use as activists. So many of you here are either knocking on doors, making phone calls, writing postcards. This framework is something you can use in that work to reach out to voters. Because ultimately, what we want to talk about is our values and what they're doing to fight against those values and how if we come together, we can actually realize the vision of those values. And that's a pretty simple thing. So it doesn't have to be complicated. Messaging doesn't have to be complicated at all. Um, and it can be fun and it can actually be something that as adults, we can internalize something brand new that we never thought about before. Um, so I do really encourage folks to join the training. And I think I put a link in the chat, but if not, there's a link I, in the chat. Natalie, did you want us to share the slide or is, are you past that? Oh, uh, if you want to share the slide, feel free because that has the date for the training. And I want to make sure folks know um, that this really is a training that's going to be a three-part training. So we're going to introduce the concepts in the first one. You're going to have some reading before the, the uh, first training. You're going to have some homework after the first training. Then we're going to come back in the second training, go over that homework talk about what works, talks about um, you know, what we can do better. And we'll, it's gonna be a very sort of safe collaborative space that we can all do this together. You're gonna get a new homework assignment. Either you can go back and refine what you worked on the first time, or you can pick a new topic area. And then we're gonna come back a third time again as a group um, to review it so that we can start to sort of build that muscle memory of how to use this new framework that allows us to lead with our values. And as Simon said, to really, tell the story. And I think this is the important thing. Simon has an incredible amount of data. If you spend any time on Hopium or on Twitter, you'll see that the amount of information, sheer information he puts out is tremendous. What we all need is a way to speak about it um, that is conversational, that is narrative, that is story driven, and that reflects um, you know, what the average person relates to. Um, and we can do that. Uh, we just need a framework for it. So I hope all of you will join me. I don't know if you know, but there's about 270 of us on this call right now. Imagine if all 270 of us went away saying, I'm going to share the good news at least once a week, at least you know, once every other day, at least once a day. Um, imagine the megaphone and impact that we would have by doing that. Remember, the Republicans have always been top down. We've always been bottoms up. That is our strength. The grassroots is our power. So you guys are all activists already. This is just one more tool in that activist toolkit. And I think it's one of the most powerful ones we can all have uh, and use. So I look forward to folks joining the training. Natalie, thank you so much. And I also just want to point out that um, you don't have to be a social media user to benefit from this information. You know, it will also help you talk to your, in my case, uncle at Thanksgiving or, you know, a colleague at work or whatever. It's, we would love for you to use social media and then get into that world. But if that's not for you, it's still incredibly valuable. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Bruce, who is, has taken your questions from the chat and grouped them and is now going to ask uh, read some of those questions for Simon to address. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, one thing I realized, uh, one little housekeeping detail we didn't say is that uh, this this seminar is organized through Swing Left Peninsula, and a lot of you have now joined uh, our email, email list. So you may see email from us, and if you're wondering how you got on, it's it's because you signed up for this seminar. And I'm sure we'll have responses uh, to some of these things going out in our emails. So uh, I just wanted to say that. So uh, first question for Simon is, uh, uh, can you speak a little bit about the, the 
the National Democratic Party and some of the state level Democratic parties? And do they recognize the power of the grassroots groups? Uh, do we have a seat at the table? Uh, can we work more closely with them? What's going on? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, look, I've been doing this for over 30 years and, you know, I've worked in campaigns and been in the business and I didn't know how, what had happened over recent years. I didn't understand that in part because of Zoom, which really lowered the barrier to entry for a lot of people to get into the game. I mean, you can be making dinner and be on a conversation like this, as opposed to having to go to the Democratic Party meeting, right, which is how a lot of this stuff happened, you know, for years and years. There's just been an explosion of citizen activism, in part because the technology has made it easier for you to stay engaged through Zooms, and also the remote technology of post, you know, of, of texting and phone calling, where you can call into anywhere in the country from wherever you sit. And I think also the postcard revolution has been really important for giving people a comfort level of being able to participate in ways. And so I think there's been huge innovations that have happened that have made it easier for people to stay engaged with politics and to take meaningful action. And I don't know that people in Washington really understand the extent of this. I, I am, I've, I've been called the ambassador of the grassroots in the in Washington, and I'm happy to take that on. And I'm, you know, I've had meetings with people at the DNC and, and others. And I do think that my recommendation to all of you is that at a local level is that you're not always going to get along with the party, right? The party is not always going, you're not always going to be in agreement with what the party does or who they endorse. And sometimes they may not really want you around, whatever it is. We're all family, right? We're all part of the same family. We all got to get along because it's, they win when we, when we split, they win the, you know, we know this from in the United States and also from around the world that MAGA parties gain power when the coalition, the big pro-democracy coalition splits. And it's why we just have to get along. You know, it's in this critical time that we're in, we've got to find ways to recognize that we're playing different positions on the same team, right? Is the way I like to talk about it. And I just, and so part of the, what I'm doing is I'm doing as many of these events that as I possibly can, I've probably done eight of these so far this year. I've got another eight or nine scheduled just in the next you know, six weeks. And I'm doing it because I wanna say thanks to all of you and to encourage you to keep going because it really matters. I mean, what we did together in 2022, what we just did in Wisconsin, I mean, this is because of all of you, right? And we had good candidates and all that stuff, but you know, our campaigns were outraising Republican campaigns in the battleground by five or six to one. That's never happened before. And it also meant that not only could we put more ads on the air and have more staff fighting out the information war every day, but it allowed us to build unprecedentedly large grassroots operations, which then pushed the vote through the roof in, you know, all throughout the battleground of the country. And so, you know, in, in the battleground states. And so, you know, this is a very exciting time. And what in my own view and what I tell people in Washington is that. The reason these groups are successful and the reason why you have to stay, in my view, outside the party is that, you know, there's ownership. You have ownership over what you're doing. You feel like you're building something. And as somebody who's been an entrepreneur and loves to build things, I know how powerful that is. And so, you know, it's a very de Tocquevillean thing if you've studied, you know, to who know if you know who de Tocqueville is. And I, so I love what's happening here. It's why we are muscular and strong. And by the way, the Republicans all their money goes into these outside media organizations. They're not building these kinds of grassroots organizations. It's all top-down stuff. This is better politics. We're building a better politics. It's more small D democratic, but it's also raising more money. It's we're pushing the vote through the roof, right? We are stronger as a national party than they are. They may have more money, but we spend our money far more wisely than they do. And, in, and we have all of you doing this incredible work. And so if I can just leave you with one sort of big thought, because I'm speaking to groups like this all over the country, this is a national movement. This is something that sprung up organically in the United States, because out of fear of MAGA, the ups, the anger over the 2016 election, COVID, blah, blah, blah. And how inspiring is that? It's why I've changed my work. I've changed what I do as a political professional in part to work more closely with the grassroots groups, 
because I understand the power of what's happening here. And I just want to help, right? It's not, no one can control this. There's no one in charge of this. This is what makes it so powerful in my view. And so thanks to all of you for being part of this critical work for the future of the country. Thank you. So I'm going to preface this next one by saying, I know there is no such thing as the Latino vote. Yeah. Um, so having said that, uh, how can we be most effective with Latino voters? I'm really glad you asked. And I, and I'm, I realize now, Laura, I didn't talk about that in my comments and I, I was remiss. So thank you, uh, Bruce, for asking. Listen, there, there's, I, there's red wavy myth about the Latino vote here a little bit in the United States. You know, we just had the best showing in the southwestern part of the United States in these last two elections than we've had in 80 years. I mean, we had not, you know, and it's all because of the Latino vote. And the way to think about the Latino vote in the United States is, is that um, in, it's growing so much and it's becoming so powerful. And I've been involved in, I produced the first Spanish language ads ever produced by a democratic political organization. I introduced bilingual polling to the Democratic Party in 2002 with Ken Salazar and Bob Menendez. I've worked on these Hispanic, the Hispanic vote issue for a long time. And here's some basic math, right? In 2004, the, um, our net margin with Hispanics, meaning how many more votes we got with Hispanic voters than Republicans was 700,000 nationally. In 2020, it was between four and a half and five and a half million, depending on which data you believe. And that's because even though we fell back a little bit, a smaller piece of a bigger pie is still more pie. And the success that we've had in Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, in 2004, Bush won Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico. We, they controlled five out of the eight Senate seats there. They controlled 14 out of the 21 House seats. In 2020, we controlled all the Senate seats up from you know, three. We won all four of those states for the first time since 1940. And we controlled 14 out of the 23 House seats. Our entire majority in the House and Senate in recent years has been because of the gains that we've made in the Southwest and because of the Hispanic vote. The Hispanic vote has, we, it has been a wild success story. We would not be the party we are today without Hispanic leaders, you know, Ben Ray Lujan was the Democrat who flipped the House. Uh, Cortez, Senator Cortez Masto was the strategist who flipped the Senate, right? And, you know, we, it is incredible the contributions that Hispanics have made. And I've been fighting really hard because this perception that there's been a fallback, we may be getting a slightly smaller percentage of the Hispanic vote than we were getting a few years ago, but we're getting more votes because of the growth of the population. So, you know, this is a success story uh, of the Democratic Party, not a failure. Florida is, is separate, but, but as all of you know, the Hispanic, the so-called Hispanic vote in Florida is very different than the West, which is heavily dominated by Mexican-American, you know, descendant immigrants, whereas in Florida, it's much more Caribbean immigrants, a completely different electorate there. And so don't let the fall, the struggles we've had in Florida obscure the success that we've had in other places. And so, you know, we would not be in the control of the Senate without the Hispanic vote. And so this has been a success story, but, you know, it's like any other group you talk to, right? You got to show respect and you have to speak to them to engage them in culturally relevant ways. And, and, and you know, it's, there's, you know, politics in some ways is actually pretty easy, which is that if you want somebody's vote, you got to ask for it. You've got to demonstrate respect. You've got to show up in their community. You can't drop ads three weeks before the election and expect everything to be fine. You know, if you're going to want somebody to be on your team, you've got to go earn it. And for us, we have to get better at understanding that every two years, there's a huge number of new voters, Hispanic voters. We have to go earn the Hispanic vote all over again every two years. And because it's so young and because there's so many new and episodic voters in the Hispanic community. But this is an area that we have actually, there's a lot of people who've done very good work here, but it's in some ways it's very simple, which is if we don't spend the money, if we don't make the effort, if we don't show up, right, we're not gonna get the results that we want. And we've got to do a better job at that. Okay, I expect Laurel will cut us off. First, I think we maybe have time for maybe one more and then I'll wrap it up. Okay, can you speak? There's been a lot of chatter about high school and college student vote and registering young people. Can yeah. you say a little bit about that? 
I know the Civic, somebody I saw in the chat, the Civic Center, which is based in LA, is doing a lot of great work in high school. Yeah, look, we, we there's a basic reality here. You know, I talk about getting to 55, you know, it's man on the moon kind of stuff, right? We got to go get there. It's unacceptable as Democrats that the people who are most democratic vote the least. We just have to change that. We have the resources. We have the ability to do this. It's like the Hispanic vote. We can't get young people's vote. You know, the, the fact that young people don't vote more, that's our fault. That's not their fault. And this blame that goes on on young people for not voting more, it shows up on my Twitter feed and Hopium all the time. It's crazy, right? I mean, we know from the work that the Civic Center has done is that the percentage of registered young people who vote is the same as older people. It's just younger people are not registered as much as older people. Well, whose fault is that? Right? That's our fault. And so we can fix that. <laughs> you know, we have the resources, we have the time, and we can do this. We can dramatically alter and reshape the electorate in a way that benefits the Democratic Party in literally all 50 states. This is why I think this has to be a national project. I often get asked, you know, how do what do we do in red states? How do we get it? Well, everyone's got to dive into young voters. And, you know, there's been a structural change with young voters. People don't know this. This is in my Hopium work. In the Clinton era and the Bush era, right, under 45-year-old voters were a swing vote. You know, Bush won them sometimes, right? We won them sometimes. It was not structurally, young people were not structurally democratic during those years. Um, they became structurally democratic late in the Bush presidency when the Iraq war, the failure of the Iraq war, you know, sort of made older millennials, you know, pushed older millennials into the Democratic Party. Obama then welcomed them and built a politics around it. You know, we now are getting our margins nationally in our elections are coming from young people. So it, there is an urgency. If you want to figure out how to close the gap in Nebraska, if you want to work and get do better in rural parts of California, whatever it is, we got to go into young people. And I think it's in part, it's been also because of abortion, right, which has magnified, you know, and created, I, I have this belief, and let me say this, and this will be the last thing I'll say, Laura, is that I don't think we even yet have any understanding of what the abortion issue is going to do to our politics in the country. I mean, if you're a 25 year old Latino and Latina family in Texas, and there's now a 25% chance, higher chance that your wife could die when she has a miscarriage, are you ever going to vote for that party ever again the rest of your life? Right? I, I just don't, I don't know. I mean, I think that what's happening, not with Dobbs, but with the abortion restrictions, is some of the most savage think politics and the most aggressive, you know, dangerous acts that a political party have taken in our history. And they deserve to be out of power for 30 years for what they're doing. And because they're endangering the lives of women unnecessarily in ways that, you know, it's painful to even talk about, right? What's going on here. And that's why we have to get to 55. They cannot, the risk of them winning this next election after what they've done is so great. The validation of this politics, which is why we've got to go big, you know, be on offense, play it hard, be here, you know, in April of a non-election year with all of you, right? You know, the country's counting on us. And frankly, I think the Republicans have given us an unprecedented set of tools to grow our vote to go big, get to 55, and really break their back in this next election. So thanks, everybody, and keep working hard. I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be with you. And just as a fellow American, thank you for all your incredible work.